All right, so this is the Sanfords now. You may or may not know what I'm about to read for you. It says, we know that in God there's power to forgive and be forgiven, to change, to grow, and to overcome. Over the course of their ministry, with about 40 years that they ran a counseling ministry, which is still in operation even though they're gone. Uh, they're home with the Lord now. So we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands of hours in the counseling room and training people and the staff there. Uh, they know, they're saying this with high conviction, that in God there's power to forgive and be forgiven, change, grow, and overcome. Until last year, they said, we would have declared this by faith to those who were wounded by abuse from our relatively safe position as counselors. Today, having lost a beloved son-in-law who molested one of his own children. That's their grandchild. We've personally experienced the pain and struggle that beset many of you. Okay, so here, how ironic, right? They knew all the things to do to help prevent this from happening, and it still happened right in their own family. So they then had to start to practice with their son-in-law what they were telling everybody else they had to do. Now, God's not in that. Like, he's not purposely trying to dangle it in front of you. But he's saying, look, it's like Corey Ten Boom having to, she preaches about forgiveness, and then the prison guard that was in her camp comes up and says, will you forgive me? <laughs> oh, really? It's not just theory anymore. It's practice. <sighs> so they lost you know, their son-in-law who molested one of his own children, and we have personally experienced that pain. And we say to you with more conviction than ever before, they go on to say that God loves all of us unconditionally, and he calls us to love one another and minister to one another with that same love. You wouldn't know this, but I remember reading it, that their son-in-law went to prison and then came out of prison and was living in the town, and John Sanford used to take him out for coffee on Saturday mornings and try to minister healing to him. And it would have been very easy to say, that's not my job, I'm going to leave that up to somebody else. Joyce Meyer could have said that about her father, right? Some of you are looking at me like, I hope he doesn't ask me to do that. <laughs> it's very difficult for the one who's been deeply wounded by abuse to understand that forgiveness, what? Must be extended. All right, this is not an option. It's a really hard reality, but it must be extended. It seems that the abuser deserves to be punished. In the victim's helplessness, the hate, anger, and resentment may have seemed to be the only means of retaliation. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be best friends with the person who hurt you, okay? That's where it gets a little confusing to people. Well, if I forgive them, am I saying that what they did was not a problem? Not at all. Not at all. Do we have to have dinner together? No. Okay? Should you feel sick when you see them? No. Right? I mean, that wouldn't be God's perfect plan. When you really forgive them, you accomplish that forgiveness, and you're able to hand them over to the Lord and say, this is your child. He needs healing. She needs healing. If there's something I could do to help that process, I want to be part of it. But I think it's more than what I can just do alone. I'll do my part, but I hope they have a revival in their lives because they are a mess if they could have done that to me. has to be extended. All right. An effective way to begin then is first to empathize. <sighs> So hard, right? How do I empathize with somebody who did something that I don't think I could have ever done? Can I be honest? You can't say I would have never done something because you don't know the pain the person was in that did what they did. You've had a different life than they've had. We've all had very different lives, and I don't mean to be flip about this. It's not excusing what they did, but that's just another fact that if you were in Germany when Hitler took over, the odds that you would have helped the Germans put the Jews in the prison camp are much higher than you would have been Schindler. <laughs> Sorry. Hate to break the news. It's just life. We all believe that we would be Schindler, but the reality is that people look the other way, and they just can't muster the courage to do it, right? And, and this is just why God hates injustice so much, because the bullies are tyrants. And they rule by that tyrannical rule. Okay, I'm not meaning to, you know, say I'm never going back to that church again. I'm not, I'm not meaning to say anything other than if you think you could never do something, be careful. The capacity in our humanity is there 
to do really evil things. We don't want to believe that we would ever do them, but could we? Yes. So should we start this conversation about having empathy for the person who hurt me? Yes. Go into the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. And what did he do? He identified with the sin of humanity. He had to look across that prayer garden and look at us and say, if I were you, I could have done what you did. So I'm going to surrender my life for yours. So you get in your garden with the person who hurt you, and you say, I'm choosing now as an act of my will to forgive you, clean the slate, and let you go of the pain that you caused me. I'm wanting retribution for that. I'm giving you to God, and I'm praying for a revival in your life so that the, the twisted part of your life will get healed and changed. Do I hope you come back and apologize? Yes. My forgiveness is not contingent on that, though. It's a tough one, isn't it? All right. So the first way to begin is to empathize. Then to explain that anger, hate, and resentment held in our hearts work inside us like a poisonous substance, okay? So what he's saying is if we're in a position to talk, some, talk to somebody who's been in an abusive situation and been abused, we have to try to help convince them that their current condition is not the optimum one that God wants for them. Holding on to this hatred is acting like a poison in their system. If allowed to remain, they'll sicken not only our hearts and our minds and our spirits, but they affect our physical health as well because of the tension that they create. And in Psalm 32, 3, it says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. We thereby lose peace, joy, and the ability to expect and receive kindness from those who are prepared to give it. Can you think about this for a minute? What happens when you get numb? Or if you've ever been in a traumatic situation, you know that expression, shell-shocked? That goes back to World War I when the, when the soldiers would come home. It's a physical condition. They were being shelled. There were bombs going off all around them, and they survived, but they were so traumatized that they were physically here, but they weren't 100% emotionally here because they were in shock. And that happens to us in different stages. God can heal it. God wants to heal that. But if we hold on to unforgiveness, it's allowing that thing to ha have a home to harbor in. So it can affect our physical presence. I just want to read it again. We lose peace. We lose joy. The ability to expect and receive kindness from those who are prepared to give it. We're, we're like semi-zombies. We're walking around. We're going through the motions. We're physically there, but we're not all emotionally engaged because we can't get it out of our mind what happened to us. Uh, there's a movie called American Sniper, and he's coming back and forth. He's coming out of the battlefield in Afghanistan, and he's coming home to family picnics with no debriefing process, no counselor. And one day, there's one scene in the movie where he's sitting in the living room staring at the TV, but the TV's not on. And everybody in the family's out in the backyard having a, you know, picnic, and he's just shell-shocked. And he walks out in the backyard, and he sees a kid getting rough with a dog, and he thinks the dog's going to hurt the kid, and he shifts into this mode. He gets triggered, and he shifts back into battlefield mode. He's ready to kill the dog. Involuntary reaction. I think I told you I saw Marcus Luttrell, the Navy SEAL, lone survivor, we're in a conference center in a big hotel, and he walks in with a golden retriever. I didn't even get it at the time. Now I understand. The dog was there with him in case he got triggered. He could have been walking down the street, and a, a car could have backfired, and he could have thought it was a gunshot, and he'd get triggered. Now, the dog is so sensitively trained that it can tell if he shifts into that mode because we emote certain kind of stress hormones. And the dog's trained to start licking his hand and jumping up on him to say, snap out of it. This isn't real, what you're going through. Can you imagine? And we're supposed to identify with that person, even though we have never had anything close to that happen in our lives. Yes. Why? Because God loves that person, wants them healed. So he will allow you to feel it if you'll allow him to let you feel it. Not so easy, is it? Can't somebody else do that? Trish is really good at this. Can't we call her? She is, by the way. If hate is allowed to remain and grow, it will someday be out of control. We'll find ourselves hurting someone else in the same way that we were hurt. 
At this point, it's often possible to begin to talk somewhat about how the abuser would not have done what he did had he not or she not been wounded themselves. If the wounded one can make an identification with the woundedness of the abuser, then some basis for compassion may be laid, which more easily allows forgiveness to occur. God will deal with those who sin against us. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12, 19. Obviously, forgiveness is not easy. It's not something we can, this is really powerful. Just take a look at this one, okay? It's not something we can accomplish. You can't accomplish forgiveness by an act of your will, but you can choose by an act of your will to forgive. And that's right back to Corey Ten Boom. That's exactly how she said it. Here I am standing. I see the prison guard from the camp walking up the aisle. He doesn't recognize me, but I recognize him. And I say to the Lord, how am I going to do this? I can't make a choice to forgive. I can't Forgive him in my own strength, but I can choose to extend my hand, and you can fill me with the ability to forgive him. <laughs> oh, my God. Read that book. And then it says, uh, all right, we can choose by an act of our will to forgive, and we can choose for him to make us willing. <laughs> That's spoken like a real counselor. <laughs> you see it? We can't accomplish Forgiveness by an act of our will, but we can choose by an act of our will to forgive, and then we can choose to allow him to make us willing. <laughs> That's decades of counseling right there, summed up. We'll probably need to, need to make that choice again and again. In the process, the Lord himself will cause it to become real in our hearts because we are no longer willfully hanging on to the right to hate somebody. And this is where we talk about layers of the onion getting peeled back and stages of healing that happen. And I think if you think about it in the extreme, if somebody had such a traumatic life, it's not always the case that they're going to be able to handle all those memories in a short place. Sometimes God can just supernaturally do it. Other times it's paced. And we work with the Lord in the pacing and we pray and we fast and we intercede and we ask him for the clues and, and where the stumbling blocks might be, but we trust him in the process for the healing, okay? And we don't feel like we have to rush him. He's not looking to cause us to suffer any longer than necessary. It's not that. It's like if somebody needs a heart operation but their blood pressure is too high, you have to wait until this part gets down. You've got to get the blood pressure down before they can handle the operation, and that's how our emotions are. They can be pretty fragile. So he'll build it back to the extent that we're willing to allow him to. Hope I don't sound like I'm trying to practice medicine without a license. <laughs> but here, I just wanted to focus. We'll probably need to make that choice again and again, okay? Until it's accomplished, we have forgiven the person to a certain level, but it's not fully accomplished. So that's part of the choice. I choose to be willing, Lord. I choose to let you work through me so that I can forgive this person. 